Chapter 7 The Visitor I don't know, Momo said one day. Seems to me our old friends come here less and less often than they used to. I haven't seen some of them for ages. She was sitting between Guido Guide and Beppo Roadsweeper on the grass-grown steps of the ruined amphitheater, watching the sun go down. Yes, Guido said pensively, it's the same with me. Fewer and fewer people listen to my stories. It isn't like it used to be. Something's wrong. But what? said Momo. Guido shrugged, spat on the slate he'd been writing on, and thoughtfully rubbed the letters out. Beppo had found the slate in a garbage can some weeks before and presented it to Momo. It wasn't a new one, of course, and it had a big crack down the middle, but it was quite usable all the same. Guido had been teaching Momo her alphabet ever since. Momo had a very good memory, so she could already read quite well, though her writing was coming on more slowly. Beppo, who had been pondering Momo's question, nodded and said, You're right, it's closing in. It's the same all over the city. I've noticed it quite for a time. Noticed what? asked Momo. Beppo thought a while. Then he said, Nothing good. There was another pause before he added, It's getting cold. Never mind, said Guido, putting his arm consolingly around Momo's shoulders. More and more children come here anyway. Exactly, said Beppo. That's just it. What do you mean? Momo asked. Beppo thought for a long time before replying. They don't come for the sake of our company, he said. It's a refugee they are after, that's all. They looked down at the stretch of grass in the middle of the amphitheater where a newly invented game was in progress. The children included several of Momo's old friends. Paolo, the boy who wore glasses, Maria and her little sister Rosa, Massimo, the fat boy with the squeaky voice, and Franco, the lad who always looked rather ragged and unkempt. In addition to them, however, there were a number of children who had only been coming for the past few days and one small boy who had first appeared that morning. It looked as if Guido was right. Their numbers were increasing every day. Momo would have been delighted, except that most of the newcomers had no idea how to play. All they did was sit around, looking bored and sullen, and watching Momo and her friends. Sometimes they deliberately broke up their other children's games and spoiled everything. Scrabbles and scuffles were frequent, though these never lasted long, because Momo's presence had its usual effect on the newcomers, too. So they soon started having bright ideas themselves and joining in with a will. The trouble was, new children turned up nearly every day, some of them from distant parts of the city, and one spoil sport was enough to ruin a game for everyone else. But there was another thing Momo couldn't quite understand, a thing that hadn't happened until very recently. More and more often these days, children turned up with all kinds of toys you couldn't really play with. Remote-controlled tanks that turned to and fro, but did little else. Or space rockets that whizzed around on strings, but got nowhere or muddle robots that waggled along with eyes flashing and heads swiveling, but that was all. They were highly expensive toys, such as Momo's friends had never owned, still less Momo herself. Most noticeable of all, they were so complete, down to the tiniest detail, that they left nothing at all to the imagination. Their owners would spend hours watching them, mesmerized but bored, as they turned or whistled or waddled along. Finally, when that paled, they would go back to the familiar old games in which a couple of cardboard boxes, 
a torn tablecloth, a molehill or a handful of pebbles were quite sufficient to conjure up a whole world of make-beliefs. For some reason, this evening's game didn't seem to be going too well. The children dropped out one by one, until they all sat clustered around Guido, Beppo and Momo. They were hoping for a story from Guido, but that was impossible because the latest arrival had brought along a transistor radio. He was sitting a few feet away with the volume at full blast, listening to commercials. Turn it down, can't you? growled Franco, the shabby-looking lad. The newcomer pointed to the radio and shook his head. Can't hear you, he said with an impudent grin. Turn it down, shouted Franco, rising to his feet. The newcomer paled a little but looked defiant. Nobody tells me what to do, he said. I can have my radio on as loud as I like. He's right, said old Beppo. He's right, said old Beppo. We can't forbid him to make such a dine. The most we can do is to ask him not to. Franco sat down again. Then he ought to go somewhere else, he grumbled. He's already ruined the whole afternoon. I expect he has his reasons, Beppo said, studying the newcomer intently but not unkindly through his little steel-rimmed spectacles. He's sure to have. The newcomer said nothing, but moments later he turned his radio down and looked away. Momo went over and sat down quietly beside him. He switched off the radio altogether, and for a while all was still. Tell us a story, Guido, begged one of the recent arrivals. Oh yes, do, the others chimed in. A funny one, no, no, an exciting one, no, a fairy tale, no, an adventure story. But Guido, for the first time ever, wasn't in the mood for telling stories. At length he said, I'd far rather you told me something about yourselves and your homes, how you spend your time and why you come here. The children relapsed into silence. All of a sudden, they looked dejected and uncommunicative. We've got a nice new car, one of them said at last. On Saturdays, when my mother and father have time, they wash it. I've been good, I'm allowed to help. I want a car like that when I'm older. My parents let me go to the cinema every day if I like, said a little girl. They don't have time to look after me, you see and it's cheaper than a babysitter. That's why I sneak off here and save the money they give me for the cinema. When I've saved up enough, I'm going to buy an aeroplane ticket and go to see the seven dwarfs. Don't be silly, said another child. They don't exist. They do so, retorted the little girl. I've even seen pictures of them in a travel brochure. I've got eleven books on tape, said a little boy, so I can listen to them whenever I like. Once upon a time my dad used to tell me the stories when he came home from work. That was nice, but he's hardly ever home these days, and even when he is, he's too tired and doesn't feel like it. What about your mother? asked Maria. She's out all day too. It's the same with us, said Maria. I'm lucky, though, having Rosa to keep me company. She hugged the little girl on her lap and went on. When I get home from school, I heat up our supper. Then I do my homework and then, she shrugged her shoulders, then we just hang around till it gets dark. We come here usually. From the way the children nodded, it was clear that they all fared much the same. Personally, I am glad my parents don't have time for me these days, said Franco, who didn't look glad in the least. They only quarrel when they're home, and then they take it out on me. Abruptly, the boy with the transistor looked up and said, At least I get a lot more pocket money than I used to. 
Sure you do, sneered Paolo. The grown-ups dish out money to get rid of us. They don't like us anymore. They don't even like themselves. If you ask me, they don't like anything anymore. That is not true, the newcomer exclaimed angrily. My parents like me a lot. It isn't their fault not having any time to spare. It's just the way things are. They gave me this transistor to keep me company, and it costs a lot. That proves that they're fond of me, doesn't it? No one spoke, and suddenly the boy who been a spoil sport all afternoon began to cry. He tried to smother his sobs and wiped his eyes with his grubby fists, but the tear flowed fast, leaving pallid snail tracks in the patches of grime on his cheeks. The other children gazed at him sympathetically or stared at the ground. They understood him now. Deep down, all of them felt as he did. They felt abandoned. After a while, Beppo repeated, Yes, it's getting cold. I may not be able to come here much longer, said Paolo, the boy with glasses. Momo looked surprised. Why not? My parents think you're a bunch of lazy good-for-nothings, Paolo explained. They say you fritter your time away. They say there are too many of your sort around. You've got so much time on your hands, other people have to make do with less and less, that's what they say, and if I keep coming here, I'll end up just like you. Again, there were nods of agreement from the other children, who had been told much the same thing. Guido looked at each of them in turn. Is that what you think of us? If so, why do you keep coming? It was Franco who broke the short silence that followed. I couldn't care less. My old man says I'll end up in prison anyway. I'm on your side. I see, Guido said sadly. So you do think we're stealing time from other people? The children dropped their eyes and looked embarrassed. At length, gazing intently into Beppo's face, Paolo said, Our parents wouldn't lie to us, would they? In a low voice, he added, Aren't you time thieves, then? At that, the old road sweeper, Beppo, rose to his full but diminutive height, solemnly raised his right hand and declared, I have never, never stolen so much of a second of another person's time, so help me God. Nor have I, said Momo. Nor I, Guido said earnestly. The children preserved an awed silence. If the three friends had given their solemn word, that was good enough. And while we are on the subject, Guido went on, let me tell you something else. Once upon a time, people used to like coming to see Momo because she listened to them and helped them to know their own minds, if you follow my meaning. Nowadays, they solemn stop to wonder what they think. They used to enjoy listening to me too, because my stories help them to forget their troubles, but they seldom bother with that either. They don't have time for such things, they say, but haven't you noticed something odd? It's strange, the things they don't have time for anymore. Guido surveyed the listening children with narrowed eyes and nodded before continuing. The other day, he said, I bumped into an old friend in town, a barber by the name of Figaro. We hadn't met quite for a while, and I hardly recognized him. He was so changed, so irritable and grumpy and depressed. He used to be a cheerful type always singing, always airing his ideas on every subject under the sun. All of a sudden he hasn't got time for anything like that. The man's just a shadow of his former self. He isn't good old Figaro anymore, if you know what I mean. But now comes the really strange part. If he were the only one, 
I'd think he'd gone a bit cracked, but he isn't. There are people like Figaro wherever you look. More and more of them every day. Even some of our oldest friends are going the same way. I'm beginning to wonder if it isn't catching. Old Beppo nodded. You're right, it must be. In that case, said Momo, looking dismayed, our friends need help. They spent a long time that evening debating what to do. Of the men in grey and their ceaseless activities, none of them yet had the faintest suspicion. Momo, who couldn't wait to ask her old friends what was wrong and why they've stopped coming to see her, spent the next few days looking them up. The first person she called on was Salvatore the Bricklayer. She knew the house well. Salvatore lived in a little garage under the roof, but he wasn't at home. According to the other tenants, he now worked on one of the big new housing developments on the far side of town and was earning a lot of money. He seldom came home at all these days, they said, and when he did, it was usually in the small hours. He'd taken to the bottle and was hard to get along with. Momo decided to wait for him just the same. So she sat down on the stairs outside his door. When it grew dark, she fell asleep. It must have been long past midnight when she was woken by the sound of unsteady footsteps and gracious singing. Salvatore came blundering upstairs, caught sight of Momo, and stopped short, looking dumbfounded. Momo, he said hoarsely, clearly embarrassed to be seen in his present condition. So you're still around, eh? What on earth are you doing here? Waiting to see you, Momo replied shyly. You're a fine one, I must say. Salvatore smiled and shook his head. Fancy turning up to see your old pal Salvatore in the middle of the night? I'd have paid you a visit myself ages ago, but I just don't have the time any more. Not for, well, personal things. He gestured vaguely and flopped down on the stairs beside her. You have no idea the kind of life I lead these days. Things aren't the way they used to be. Times are changing. Over where I'm working now, everything's done in double quick time. We all work like fury, one whole floor a day. That's what we have to sling together day after day. Yes, it isn't like it used to be. Everything's organized, every last move we make. Momo listened closely as he rambled on, and the longer she listened, the less enthusiastic he sounded. Suddenly he lapsed into silence and massaged his face with his work-roughened hands. I've been talking rubbish, he said sadly. I'm drunk again, Momo. That's the trouble. I often get drunk these days. There's no denying it. But that's the only way I can stomach the thought of what we're doing over there. To an honest bricklayer like me, it goes against the grain. Too little cement and too much sand, if you know what that means. Four or five years is all those buildings will last. Then they'll collapse if anyone so much as blows his nose. Shoddy workmanship from top to bottom, but that's not the worst of it. Those tenements we're putting up aren't places for people to live in. They're... they're hen coops. It's enough to make you sick. Still, why should I care as long as I get my wages at the end of the week? Yes, times are changing all right. It used to give me a kick when we built something worthwhile. But now? Someday when I've made enough money, I'm going to quit this job and do something different. He propped his chin on his hands and stared mournfully into space. Momo still said nothing. 
just went on listening. When Salvatore spoke again, he sounded a little brighter. Maybe I should start coming to see you again and telling you my troubles. Yes, I really should. What about tomorrow or the day after? I'll have to see if I can fit it in, but I'll come, never fear. Is it a date? Momo nodded happily. Then, because they were both very tired, they said good night and she left. But Salvatore never turned up, neither the next day or the day after that. He never turned up at all. The next people Momo called on were Nino the innkeeper and his fat wife Liliana. Their little old tavern, which had damp stained walls and a vine growing around the door, was on the outskirts of town. Momo went around to the back as she used to do in the old days. Through the kitchen door, which was open, she could hear Nino and Liliana quarreling violently. Liliana, her plump face shiny with sweat, was clattering spots and pans around on the stove, while Nino shouted and gesticulated at her. Their baby was lying in a basketwork crib in the corner, screaming. Momo sat down quietly beside the baby, took it on her lap and rocked it gently to and fro until it stopped crying. The grown-ups interrupted their war of words and glanced in her direction. Oh, it's you, said Nino, with a ghost of a smile. Nice to see you again, Momo. Hungry, Liliana inquired rather brusquely. Momo shook her head. So, what do you want? Nino demanded. He sounded grumpy. We're rather pressed for time just now. I only wanted to ask why it's been so long since you came to see me, Momo said softly. Nino frowned. Search me, he said irritably. I've got enough worries as it is. Yes, snapped Liliana, he certainly has. Getting rid of our regular customers, that's all he worries about these days. Remember the old man who always used to sit at the corner table in the bar, Momo? Well, he sent them packing, he chucked them out. No, I didn't, Nino protested. I asked them quite politely to take their custom elsewhere. As landlord of this inn, I was perfectly within my rights. Your rights, your rights, Liliana said angrily. You simply can't act that way. It's mean and cruel. You know they'll never find another inn as easygoing as ours. It wasn't as if they were disturbing anyone. There wasn't anyone to disturb, that's why, retorted Nino. No decent, well-heeled customers would patronize this place with those stubble-chinned old codgers who were lolling about in the corner. Besides, there's little enough profit in one measly glass of cheap red wine, which was all they could afford in an evening. We'll never get anywhere at this rate. Liliana shrugged. We've done all right so far? So far, maybe, Nino said fiercely. But you know yourself we can't go on like this. They've just raised our rent. I've got to pay 30% more than before, and everything's getting more expensive all the time. How am I going to find the money if I turn this place into a home for doddering old down and outs? Why should I go easy on other people? No one goes easy on me. Liliana banged the saucepan down on the stove so hard that the lid rattled. Let me remind you of something, she said, putting her hands on her mountainous hips. One of those doddering old down and outs, as you call them, is my uncle Enrico, and I won't have you insulting my relations. Enrico's a decent, respectable man, even if he doesn't have much money to splash around like those well-heeled customers you've set your heart on. 
But Enrique's free to come here any time, Nino said with a lordly gesture. I told him he could stay if he wanted, but he wouldn't. Without his cronies? Of course he wouldn't. What did you expect him to do? Sit in a corner by himself? That settles it then, Nino shouted. In any case, I've no intention of ending my days as a small-time innkeeper just for your uncle Enrico's benefit. I want to get somewhere in life. Is that such a crime? I am to make a success of this place, and not just for my own sake. I'm thinking of you and the baby as well, Liliana. Don't you understand? No, I don't, Liliana said sharply. If being heartless is the only way you can get somewhere in life, count me out. I warn you, sooner or later I'll pack you up and leave you, so suit yourself. On that note, she took the baby from Momo, it had started crying again, and flounced out of the kitchen. Nino said nothing for a long time. He lit a cigarette and twiddled it between his fingers while Momo sat watching him. As a matter of fact, he said eventually, they were nice old boys. I was fond of them myself. I feel bad about them, Momo. But what else could I do? Times have changed, you see. His voice trailed off, and it was a while before he went on. Maybe Liliana was right all along. Now that the old men don't come here any more, the atmosphere seems strange, cold somehow. I don't even like the place myself. I honestly don't know what to do for the best. Everyone acts the same way these days. So why should I be the odd man out? He hesitated. Or do you think I should? Momo gave an almost imperceptible nod. Nino caught her eye and nodded too. Then they both smiled. I'm glad you came, Nino said. I'd quite forgotten the way we always used to say, why not go and see Momo? Well, I will come and see you again, and I'll bring Liliana with me. The day after tomorrow is our day off. We'll turn up then, all right? All right, said Momo, and went on her way, but not before Nino had presented her with a big bag of apples and oranges. Sure enough, Nino and Liliana turned up two days later, complete with their baby and a basket full of goodies. Just imagine, Momo, said Liliana, beaming, Nino went to see Uncle Enrico and the other old man. He apologized to them, one after the other, and asked them to come back. Nino smiled too and scratched his ear in some embarrassment. Yes, he said, and back they all came. I can say goodbye to my plans for the inn, but at least I like the place again. He chuckled, and Liliana said, We'll get by, Nino. It turned out to be a lovely afternoon, and before leaving they promised to come again soon. So Momo went the rounds of all her old friends one by one. She called on the carpenter who made her little table and chairs out of packing cases and on the woman who had brought her the bed steed. In short, she called on all the people whom she had listened to in the old days and who, thanks to her, had grown wiser, happier and more self-assured. Although some of them failed to keep their promise to come and see her, or were unable to for lack of time, so many old faces did turn up that things were almost as they used to be. Not that Momo knew it, she was upsetting the plans of the man in grey, and that they couldn't tolerate. Soon afterwards, one exceptionally hot and sultry afternoon, 
Momo came across a doll on the steps of the old amphitheater. It wasn't uncommon for children to forget all about expensive toys they couldn't really play with and leave them behind by mistake, but Momo had no recollection of seeing such a doll, and she would certainly have noticed it because it was a very unusual one. Nearly as tall as Momo herself, the doll was so lifelike that it might almost have been mistaken for a miniature human being, though not a child or a baby. Its red mini-dress and high-heeled sandals made it look more like a shop-window dummy or a stylish young woman about town. Momo stared at it, fascinated. After a while she put out her hand and touched it. Instantly the doll blinked a couple of times, opened its rosebud mouth and said in a metallic voice that sounded as if it were issuing from a telephone, Hello, I am Lola, the living doll. Momo jumped back in alarm. Then automatically she replied, Hello, I'm Momo. The doll's lips moved again. I belong to you. All the other kids envy you because I am yours. You aren't mine, Momo said. Someone must have left you here by mistake. She picked up the doll. Again the lips moved. I'd like some nice new things, said the metallic voice. Would you? Momo thought for a moment. I doubt if I got anything you'd care for, but you're welcome to have a look. Still holding the doll, Momo clambered through the hole in the wall that led to her underground room. All her most treasured possessions were in a box beneath the bed. She pulled it out and lifted the lid. Here, she said, this is all I've got. If you like anything, just tell me. And she showed the doll a colorful bird's feather, a pebble with pretty streaks in it, a brass button and a fragment of colored glass. The doll said nothing. So she nudged it. Hello, I'm Lola, the living doll. I know, said Momo, but you told me you wanted something. How about this lovely pink seashell? Would you like it? I belong to you. All the other kids envy you because I am yours. You told me that too, said Momo. All right, if you don't want any of my things, Perhaps we could play a game together, shall we? I'd like some nice new things, the doll repeated. I don't have anything else, Momo said. She took the doll and climbed back outside again. Then she put Lola, the living doll, on the ground and sat down facing her. Let's pretend you've come to pay me a visit, Momo suggested. Hello, I'm Lola. The living doll. How nice of you to call, Momo replied politely. Have you come far? I belong to you. All the other kids envy you because I am yours. Look, said Momo, we'll never get anywhere if you go on repeating yourself like this. I'd like some nice new things, said the doll, fluttering its eyelashes. Momo tried several games in turn, but nothing came of them. If only the doll had remained silent, she could have supplied the answers herself and held an interesting conversation with it. As it was, the very fact that it could talk made conversation impossible. Before long, Momo was overcome by a sensation so entirely new to her that she took quite a while to recognize it as a plain boredom. Although her inclination was to abandon Lola, the living doll, and play some other game, she couldn't for some reason tear herself away. So there she sat, gazing at the doll, and the doll with its glassy blue eyes fixed on hers gazed back. 
It was as if they had hypnotized each other. When, at long last, Momo did manage to drag her eyes away from the doll, she gave a little start of surprise. Parked close by, not that she had heard it drive up, stood a smart grey car. In it sat a man wearing a suit as grey as a spider's web and a stiff rounded bowler hat of the same colour. He was smoking a small grey cigar and his face too was as grey as ashes. He must have been watching Momo for some time because he nodded and smiled at her, and although the day was so hot that the air was dancing in the sunlight, Momo suddenly began to shiver. The man opened the car door and came over, carrying a steel-gray briefcase. What a lovely doll you have there, he said in a peculiar flat and expressionless voice. It must be the envy of all your playmates. Momo just shrugged and said nothing. I'll bet it cost a fortune, the man in grey went on. I wouldn't know, Momo mumbled, feeling rather embarrassed. I found it lying around. Well, I never, said the man in grey. You are a lucky girl, and no mistake. Momo remained silent and hugged her baggy jacket tightly to her. It was growing colder and colder. All the same, you don't seem too pleased, said the man in grey with a thin-lipped smile. Momo shook her head. She suddenly felt as if happiness had fled the world forever, or rather as if happiness had never existed and all her ideas of it had been merely figments of her own imagination. At the same time, she had a presentiment of danger. I've been watching you for quite a while, pursued the man in grey. From what I've seen, you don't have the first idea how to play with such a marvelous doll. Shall I show you? Momo stared at him in surprise and nodded. I'd like some nice new things, the doll squawked suddenly. You see, said the man in grey, she's actually telling you herself. You can't play with a marvellous doll like this the way you'd play with any old doll, that's obvious. Anyway, it isn't what she's meant for you. If you don't want to get bored with her, you have to give her things. Look here. He went back to the car and opened the trunk. In the first place, he said, she needs plenty of clothes, like this gorgeous evening gown, for instance. He pulled out a gown and tossed it to Momo. And here's a genuine mink coat and a tennis dress and a skiing outfit and a swimsuit and a riding habit and some pyjamas, and a nighty, and another dress, and another, and another, and another. One by one, he tossed them over till they formed a huge heap on the ground between Momo and the doll. There, he said with another thin-lipped smile, that should keep you happy for a while, shouldn't it? Or are you going to get bored again after a couple of days? Very well, you'll just have to have some more nice things for your doll. And he reached inside the trunk again. Here, for instance, is a real little snakeskin purse with a real little lipstick and powder compact inside. Here's a miniature camera and a tennis racket and a doll's TV set that really works. Here's a bracelet, a necklace some earrings, a doll's gold-plated automatic, some silk stockings, a feather boa, a straw hat, an Easter bonnet, some miniature golf clubs, a little checkbook, perfume, bath salts, body lotion. He broke off and glanced keenly at Momo, who was sitting amid this clutter of toys, 
with a stunned expression on her face. You see, he said, it's quite simple. As long as you go on getting more and more things, you'll never get bored. I know what you're going to say. Sooner or later Lola will have everything, and then I'll be bored again. Well, there's no fear of that. Here we have the perfect boyfriend for Lola. This time, when he reached into the trunk, he produced a boy doll. It was the same size as Lola and just as lifelike. Look, this is Butch. He has any number of nice things too. And when you get bored with him, we can supply a girlfriend for Lola with masses of outfits that won't fit anyone but her. Butch has a friend too, and his friends have friends of his own, and so on at infinitum. So you see, you never get bored because the game can go on forever. There's always something left to wish for. As he spoke, the man in grey took doll after doll from the trunk, whose contents seemed inexhaustible. Momo continued to sit there, watching him rather apprehensively, while he arrayed them on the ground beside her. Well, now do you see how to play with dolls like these? He said at length, expelling a dense cloud of smoke from his cigar. Yes, said Momo, who was positively shaking with cold. Satisfied, the man in grey nodded and took another pull at his cigar. You'd like to keep all these nice things, wouldn't you? Of course you would. Very well. I'll make you a present of them. You can have them, not all at once, of course, but one at a time, and lots of other things as well. You don't have to do anything in return. Just play with them the way I've shown you. What do you say? He fixed Momo with an expectant smile. Then, when she still said nothing, just returned his gaze without smiling back, he went on quickly. You won't need your friends any more, don't you see? You'll have quite enough to amuse you when all these lovely things are yours, and you keep on getting more, won't you? You'd like that, wouldn't you? Surely you want this marvelous doll. I'll bet you've already set your heart on it. Momo dimly sensed that she had a fight on her hands. Indeed, that she was already in the thick of the fray, but she didn't know why she was fighting or with whom. The longer she listened to this stranger, the more she felt as she had felt with the doll. She could hear a voice speaking and hear the words it uttered, but she couldn't tell who was actually saying them. She shook her head. What? exclaimed the man in grey, raising his eyebrows. You modern children are never satisfied, honestly. Lola's perfect in every detail. If there's anything wrong with her, perhaps you'd care to tell me. Momo stared at the ground and thought hard. Then she said very quietly, I don't think anyone could love it. Her, I mean. The man in grey didn't answer for some time. He stared into space with eye as glassy as the doll's. At last he pulled himself together. That's not the point, he said coldly. Momo met his eyes. What scared her most about him was the icy chill that seemed to emanate from his body. Yet, in some strange way, she couldn't have said why. She felt sorry for him as well as scared. But I do love my friends, she said. The man in grey grimaced as if he'd bitten into a lemon, but he quickly recovered his composure and gave her a razor-sharp smile. Momo, I think we should have a serious talk, you and I he said smoothly. It's time you learned what matters in life. He produced a little grey notebook from his pocket 
and leafed through it until he found what he was looking for. Your name is Momo, isn't it? Momo nodded. The man in grey shut his notebook with a snap and pocketed it again. Then, with a faint grunt of exertion, he sat himself down on the ground at Momo's side. He said no more for a while, just puffed thoroughly at his small grey cigar. All right, Momo, he said at last. Listen carefully. Momo had been trying to do this all the time, but the man in grey was far harder to listen to than anyone she'd ever heard. She could understand what other people meant and what they were like by getting right inside them, so to speak, but with him it was quite impossible. Whenever she tried to read his thoughts, she seemed to plunge headlong into a dark chasm as if there were nothing there at all. It had never ever happened to her before. All that matters in life, the man in grey went on, is to climb the ladder of success, amount to something, own things. When a person climbs higher than the rest, amounts to more, owns more things, everything else comes automatically. Friendship, love, respect, etc. You tell me you love your friends. Let's examine that statement quite objectively. He blew a few smoke rings, Momo tucked her bare feet under her skirt and burrowed still deeper into her oversized jacket. The first question to consider, pursued the man in grey, is how much your friends really gain from the fact of your existence. Are you any practical use to them? No. Do you help them to get on in the world, make more money, make something of their lives? No, again. Do you assist them in their efforts to save time? On the contrary, you distract them. You're a millstone around their necks and an obstacle to their progress. You may not realize it, Momo, but you harm your friends by simply being there. Without meaning to be, you're really their enemy. Is that what you call love? Momo didn't know what to say. She'd never looked at things that way. She even wondered for one brief moment whether the man in grey might not be right after all. And that, he went on, is why we want to protect your friends from you. If you really love them, you'll help us. We have their interests at heart, so we want them to succeed in life. We can't just look on idly while you distract them from everything that matters. We want to make sure you leave them alone. That's why we're giving you all those lovely things. Momo's lips had begun to tremble. Who is we? she asked. The time-saving bank, said the man in grey. I am agent number BLW553C. I wish you no harm, personally speaking, but the time-saving bank isn't an organization to be trifled with. Just then, Momo recalled what Beppo and Guido had said about time-saving being infectious, and she had an awful suspicion that this stranger had something to do with the spread of the epidemic. She wished from the bottom of her heart that her friends were with her now. She had never felt so alone, but she was determined not to let fear get the better of her. Summoning up all her courage, she plunged headlong into the dark chasm in which the stranger concealed his true self. He had been watching her out of the corner of his eye, so the change in her expression did not escape him. 
he lit a fresh cigar from the butt of the old one. Don't bother, he said with a sarcastic smile. You are no match for us. But Momo stood firm. Isn't there anyone who loves you? she whispered. The man in grey squirmed a little. I must say, he replied in his greyest voice, I've never met anyone like you before. Truly, I haven't. And I've met a lot of people in my life. If there were many more like you around, we'd have nothing left to live on. We'd have to close down the time-saving bank and dissolve into thin air. He broke off, staring at Momo as if she were something he could neither understand nor cope with. His face turned a shade grayer. When next he spoke, it was as if he were doing so against his will, as if the words were pouring forth despite him. At the same time, his face became more and more convulsed with horror at what was happening to him. At long last, Momo heard his real voice, which seemed to come from very far away. We have to remain unrecognized, he blurted out. No one must know of our existence or activeness. We make sure no one ever remembers us, because we can only carry on our business if we pass unnoticed. It's a wearisome business too, bleeding people of the time by the hour, minute and second. All the time they save, they lose to us. We drain it off, we hoard it, we thirst of it. Human beings have no conception of the value of their time, but we do. We suck them dry, and we need more and more time every day, because there are more and more of us, more and more, more and more. The last few words were uttered in a sort of death rattle. The man in grey clapped his hands over his mouth and stared at Momo with his eyes bulging. Little by little he seemed to emerge from a kind of trance. What, what happened? he stammered. You've been spying on me. I'm ill and it's all your fault. His tone became almost imploring. I've been talking nonsense, Momo. Forget it. Forget me like everyone else. You must. You must. He grabbed a hold of Momo and shook her. Her lips moved, but she couldn't get a word out. The man in grey jumped to his feet. He peered in all directions like a corned beast, then snatched up his briefcase and sprinted to the car. The next moment something very strange happened. Like an explosion in reverse, all the dolls and their scattered belongings flew back into the trunk which slammed shut. The car roared off at such speed that grit and pebbles sported off from its wheels. Momo sat there for a long time, trying to make sense of what she had heard. As the dreadful chill seeped slowly from her limbs, so her thoughts became steadily clearer. Now that she had heard the real voice of the man in grey, she could remember everything. From the sun-baked grass in front of her rose a slender thread of smoke. The trampled butt of a small grey cigar was smouldering away to ashes.